Let's pray together. Eternal Father, we once again draw nigh unto thee, remembering who thou art, the high and holy one, the one who dwells in inapproachable light. And Lord, we remember that thou art the God who will not look upon sin. And so we come confessing our many sins and asking that thou be pleased to cleanse us from every sin. And now, Lord, we look to thee and ask that thou be pleased to help us and aid us by thy spirit to turn aside from the things of this present age and to think upon Christ, to cast aside our cares, and, O oh Lord, to lift up our hearts even unto thee, unto heaven. And so help us in this hour to think upon thee for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll sing our first hymn, which is hymn eight from our hymn books. O Lord, our Lord, how high, how great is thine exalted name, the glories of thy heavenly state. Let men and babes proclaim.
Our first reading is from Psalm 8. Psalm 8 for our first reading. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. May the Lord bless that reading of his word to us all. Let's turn again to our hymn books and to hymn nine. Sing to the Lord who here proclaims his various and his saving names, and may they not be words alone, but by sure experience known. Sing to the Lord who here proclaim His various son, His saving names And may they not be words alone But I should experience now Our God Almighty be adored, eternal hope sufficient Through every age is great 
chest amen. is open to his Sabbath's prayer. No can but my soul complain that he does so the Lord Till the souls in Our second reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 51, and we're reading from verse 1 to 12. Jeremiah, chapter 51, verse 1 to 12. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind. And will send unto Babylon a fanners that shall fan her, and shall empty her land. For in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about, Against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifted, lifteth himself up in his brigandine, and spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her host. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts. Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off. In her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore the nations are mad. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her? Take balm for her pain. If so be she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone into his own country for her judgment reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. The Lord hath brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields, The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes for his devices against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. 
Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes. For the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. May the Lord bless that reading of his word to us all. of our messages can be freely listened to or downloaded online. We are thankful to the Lord for blessing our time together at yesterday's work party and we have one more work party planned for this Saturday, 13th of August. Our weekly Sunday school takes place between 3pm and 4pm. This is a time when children are taught lessons for life from the Bible. Please leave your hymn books on your seat after the service. There is an offering box on the wall at the back where you may place your free will offering as the Lord has blessed you. The monthly signpost meeting shall take place on the 27th of August at 3 pm. Thank you. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we continue with thee now, conscious once again of who we approach, and yet glad that we can approach thee, not because of ourselves, not because we are better than anyone, or wiser than anyone, Rather, it's because of Jesus Christ, the only Savior. He has gone into the holy place, the holy of holies, with his own blood. And he has made a way for us to enter beyond the veil, into thy very presence. And so by faith, we are in thy presence, even in heaven. And we bow down before thee, the Holy One of old, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we bow down with those thousands of thousands of angels and millions of thy people who have gone before, worshipping thee with others, thousands across the world who gather to worship thee. Thou who art worthy of all our worship, Thou who art worthy of all our praise and all our service unto Thee, O Lord, we humbly bow the knee before Thee, the one who holds all of creation in the palm of Thine hands, and we come yielding ourselves up to Thee, yielding our hearts unto Thee, asking that Thou would take us and use us in accordance to thy goodwill and pleasure. Do with us as is fitting in thy sight. O oh Lord, help us in our weaknesses, in our many troubles. Help us to rise up, to raise our eyes to thee. And Lord, once again, we acknowledge our sinfulness. And we ask that thou be pleased to help us to flee from every sin. Help us, O Lord, to hate every sinful way. And help us, O Lord, even more to seek after those 
that would rush headlong into sin and help us as thy people to turn away from er every pathway of sin. Help us even to acknowledge, O oh Lord, every sin and help us to look out one for another that we may help one another to avoid sin, to keep away from sin. Help us to encourage one another and to holiness and godliness and those things that pertain to heaven. Help us in this fellowship to truly love thee, to adore thee, to seek thy glory, the glory of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that he might have the preeminence in this place, that he might be known and loved. O oh Lord, we pray for those who know thee not. We pray that they might come to Jesus Christ, that they might know him for themselves, help them to see how wondrous Jesus Christ is. Let them to see how horrible their sin is. Help them to realize how vain this present world is. Oh Lord, help, help them to see that the future without Christ is bleak and fatal that without Christ they are nothing and they have nothing, that without Christ they are destined for a dark, empty, lonely, terrible eternity. Help them to see that they must come to thee if they would live unto thee, if they would please thee. And so help us all to love Jesus Christ. Help us to adore him. Oh, make it real for us, O oh Lord, day by day, moment by moment. He suffered many things, great things, Many temptations for our sake help us to love him dearly. And now, Lord, will thou not be pleased to bless this work, not for our sake, O oh Lord, thou knowest, but for the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to honor him in this place. Help us to do all those things thou would have us do even for thy son. And Lord, we remember now thy people who are gathered in other places. We pray for them that thou would bless them together with us as we raise one voice unto thee. And Lord, we remember any among us who might be unwell. We pray that thou be pleased to Bless us, or bless them, O oh Lord, that thou would heal them and cause them to be well again. We pray for those who are downcast, that thou would cause them to look up to thee, that thou would cause them, O oh Lord, to lean upon thee, for thou art able to lift them up. And we pray for those who maybe have turned back from the way and turned aside to the world, or to sinful things. Oh, restore them, Lord. Restore us and bring us back into thy pathway and help us once again to see that Christ is everything and that everything else is vain. We think, Lord, of the young people that gather this afternoon, the children, 
for Sunday school. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou be pleased to bless those children, cause them to know thee, help them young as they are, to see through the foolishness and vanity of this present age, that they might turn away from sin and turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. We do pray that thou be pleased to bring many into the Sunday school this afternoon, that thou be pleased to bless the teachers that teach this afternoon. And Lord, now we do pray and ask that thou be pleased to bless this nation once again. Oh Lord, we see people round about us lost without any meaning, pursuing after things that perish. We see so much perplexity and disappointment. And we do pray, O oh Lord, that thou be pleased by thy spirit to come, come down, O oh Lord, and cause many to turn away from sin and to despair of this present age and to look forward to that great age, that great world of heaven, thy kingdom, that many will be turned away from sin and from the flesh and from the evil one and from the world unto thee. And so we ask for a mighty outpouring of thy spirit even now. And Lord, we come once again pleading with thee that thou would help us now to cast our eyes upon thee and to think upon thy son, Jesus Christ, bless us richly so, even for his sake. Amen. We'll sing our third hymn, which is 506. 506, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but holy name of Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock and stone, O Father, ground is sinking sand. O Father, ground is sinking sand. And like the saints to bear his face, on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds real in my prayer Oh, Christ, the soul of the stand Oh, the is sinking sand. Oh, is sinking sand. Is of his covenant and blood so put me in the blood. So gives way, he bears all my hope 
We continue this morning in our series in Isaiah, and uh, we're staying with Isaiah 21, verse 11. A couple of things I didn't say last week uh, that I'd like to talk about today, but uh, we're thinking about Isaiah 21, verse 11, and just a reminder of uh, what we thought about last week, uh, we did say that this text is very obscure, very unclear to understand what's going on or, or what message really is being declared there, uh, but we did try to bring out some lessons and we did say that God has watchmen and these watchmen, they stand on his word and we had some lessons for ourselves from there as we said god's word every word is useful for our learning and so we look at isaiah 21 verse 11 but we want to focus on the watchman the watchman and we want to think in particular of the characteristics of a watchman. So we're continuing. The title is God's Warnings to the Nations. But we're thinking now of this text. The burden of Duma, he calleth to me out of Seir. Watchmen, what of the night? Watchman, what? of the night. It did say that Duma is another name for Edom. And how do we know that? Because Seir was a place in Edom. The Edomites are descendants of Esau. And Esau was supposed or was said to have gone up to Mount Seir. <clears throat> and so we know that this Duma has to do with Edom. And God's word about them. And the text tells us that there's a call. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? In other words, watchman, how long is the night going to last? How long is the night going to last? We want to think about watchman. Watchman, what is this watchman? That he speaks about. In particular, we want to think of the duties and obligations of a watchman. Now, in general, watchmen in the olden times, in the Old Testament times, watchmen would go up, or rather, they were given a high tower in the city, which was used to look out. 
in the surrounding areas, looking out for enemies, but even within the camp, to be able to look into the camp within to see what was going on. Because often there were enemies within and without. And so the watchman in his high tower was there to perform a duty. He had obligations, this watchman. But this word watchman is also applied spiritually to those of the Lord's prophets, his apostles, and church ministers. The prophets were to be watchmen. Jeremiah and Ezekiel make that clear. Prophets were to be lookouts, so to speak. And they were supposed to look within and beyond. The apostles as well were watchmen. And the Lord enabled both the prophets and the apostles to write down what they had seen or what they had heard from God as watchmen. And they were to inform, to rebuke, and so on, the church, or rather the Old Testament people of God, as well as the church today. And then in the last days, the latter days after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, ministers, church ministers, appointed to be watchmen. And so we want to think in particular of the duties and obligations of watchmen as applied to church ministers or prophets or apostles. And then we want to think of the requirements or the characteristics of watchmen. And then a few lessons for us from there. So firstly then, we want to think of the duties or obligations of ministers, prophets, evangelists, call them what you will. Well, firstly, they have a duty of looking out, of being lookouts. The watchman, especially the church minister, has a duty to look out. Just as the old watchman looked out to see if there were enemies coming out, coming at them, the church minister should look out. Look out for the flock. Look out for the people of God. Are there enemies wanting to dis destroy or dismantle? the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, from outside. The minister should then warn them, warn the people, or take measures to protect the people of God. These lookouts, pardon me, these enemies could be anyone. It could be the world. The world is an enemy of God's people. And so... The church minister should look out what is going on in the world and is influencing the church. They have to be on guard to look out what is affecting the church today. An example, worship is now becoming a battleground in many churches for the world. The world has come in into many churches through worship. Many churches now are using a style that can be described as new age worship style. Many churches now are using the same format for worship. They'll have a praise band at the front and they'll sing the same song whether they're Roman Catholic, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, all sorts, they're singing the same songs. Roman Catholic churches as well. They even have tongues and charismatic experiences in these churches. Sadly, even Reformed Baptist churches 
are going the same way. And in many churches, you maybe have a band or soloist. A soloist will go up and sing. And more and more, you're seeing young ladies going up front, not dressed very well, not dressed very decently. They're whispering into the microphone, heavy breathing into the microphone. What are you doing? It's almost like she's trying to seduce the people. But even young men are doing that as well. And it's up to church ministers to say, we're looking out for that, and we don't want that in our churches. And that's why a church like Salem is determined, and in our constitution, in our conduct and practice, no worldliness will be tolerated, and we'll push that back. And... Uh, Better still for us, our trustees would turf out anyone who changes the way we worship. So we have a double, double guard there. Our constitution, our trustees. Our trustees are independent of the church. And if the church decided to embrace worldly worship, the trustees would just come one morning lock up the church, change the locks, and you can't come in. So those are double guards. But the church minister has to look out. The terrible things happening out there. There's a young lady, a Roman Catholic young lady. She's written a hymn. And it's sang in many churches, including Reformed churches. Luther and Calvin would have been horrified. You're singing a song written by a Roman Catholic young lady. She hasn't rejected Mary and the worship of Mary. She hasn't rejected anything to do with the Roman Catholic religion or church. She still subscribes to everything of the Roman Catholic Church. You can look her up on the internet. I forget her first name, but her second name is A -S -S -A -D. Her name will come up sometime. But she has written a hymn or hymns. And she's quoted. Her music is played in evangelical and non-evangelical churches. It's the same music as everyone else is singing. In, in, in the world even, but as well as in the church, similar type of music. It's got similar rhythms. And they've got what are known as bridges as well in the music, where you raise up the music, so to speak. The music starts lightly, and then there's a crescendo at the end. Almost like hypnosis. Hypnosis. trying to seduce the people. But church ministers should look out for that. The world. The church leaders should look out. The watchmen should look out for things such as worldly dress. Are people dressing like the world? Or what's the world saying about dress? What's happening in terms of the young people? Women and Men, men and women, what are they dressing like? Is that coming into the church as well? Indecent dressing. And so there's a lookout by the watchman to speak about these things, to encourage, to warn, to direct and redirect, and so on. Incidentally, talking about dress, some people say, Oh, what's the matter with you, Christians? We can dress the way we like. Oh, but you're making a statement by how you dress. You're making a statement. Everyone knows that. You're making a statement by the way you dress. 
And so if you come dressed indecently, you're saying, anything goes. I don't mind. You're saying you don't mind sinning against God. So ministers, church ministers, watchmen, looking out for these things. But also, they have a duty, not just to look out, but to lift up their voices and not be silent. Isaiah 52 verse 8 speaks of watchmen lifting up their voices. They are to lift up their voices in warning, in instruction, and they are not to be afraid or embarrassed, as some people are. They're embarrassed to say that God made the world, that he made it in six days, made the whole creation. Some people are embarrassed to say that. Even reformed, some reformed evangelical Christians are afraid to say that God created the world, all things, in six days. Oh, we don't want to embarrass ourselves. What will the scientists think of us? Never mind what the scientists think of us. What does the scripture say? What has God said? And the watchman is to send an alarm and warn. And they're also to announce and proclaim judgment. The judgment of God. They're not to be afraid. Again, many churches, ministers are afraid to talk about sin and judgment. Oh, don't talk about that. It's depressing. Don't keep the world away. We want to embrace the world. So let's get rid of repentance and sin and judgment. And let's talk about love. It's all about love, you see. Let's be accepting of everyone. Nothing wrong with those people who say that there are many genders. Accept them. Agree with them. Tell them it's okay to be transgender. Tell them that the Lord loves them even as they are transgender. Now the minister must proclaim, Thus saith the Lord, duty and obligation of the watchman to be faithful to the Lord. But secondly, let's think about the requirements or characteristics, the characteristics of the watchman. In particular, church ministers, one characteristic, the first one, is they should be knowledgeable. They should know the Lord. They should know the scriptures. They should know something about what it means to be a Christian. They themselves should be Christians, but they should know what it means to be a Christian. It's one thing to know you're a Christian. It's another thing to know what it means. What does it mean? A Christian is a disciple. He's a follower. Many Christians are not walking as disciples or followers. Disciples, followers of whom? Jesus Christ. He set a pattern for his followers. They are to walk in his footsteps. And do and be all those things Christ would have them be and do. And so the church minister should have knowledge of the scriptures, knowledge of doctrine. Otherwise, how does he refute those that would speak against God's word. How does he challenge people, correct people, if he doesn't know the doctrines of the Bible? The 
whole Bible is full of doctrine. Think of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That alone has loads and loads of doctrinal meat in it. In the beginning, God. Just that. There's so much doctrine in that text. The Godhead is mentioned in that text. His eternality is mentioned in there. And we see his almightiness. Almightiness, the word God, the almighty one, the eternal one, the everlasting one. And so the preacher, the minister, prophet, evangelist, must know the doctrine of the scripture and ensure that they're always reading and reading and reading. That includes them reading good books. So the knowledge is so important as a characteristic of those who would be watchmen. But also, secondly, a characteristic of a watchman, a minister, is vigilance. Vigilance. Vigilance means that you are alert, alert to what's going on outside, what's going on inside the church, alert to what's going on with the church members. And that means looking out for church members. It doesn't mean that the church minister will be 100% perfect, but he must have a watching eye over the flock and over what's going on in the world and what's going on in his church. The minister must not be one of those who says, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening in my fellowship. Must have an ear to the ground and be vigilant. Vigilance includes encouraging certain things and discouraging other things. It includes necessarily being strict about certain things and maybe not other things. So there's a vigilance, just like a watchman would be vigilant. The church minister must not be asleep in his church. But also, thirdly, third characteristic is courage. The church minister must have courage. Courage not of the flesh, but courage of the scriptures. He must stand on the scriptures. He must, he must be one of those who will say, I will stand on this and not be shifted because God has said so. And therefore, I'm not afraid to utter God's word. I'm not afraid to stand on God's word. I'm not afraid to stand alone. He must say. If the minister has to empty his church because of the word of God, so be it. He must have that courage. Courage to give up his own life, his own ministry even, for the sake of God's word. A minister must never be afraid. Oh, if I say this, oh, Maybe if I tackle this area, the church might dismiss me or might not have a voice or I'll become unpopular. Never mind that. He must have courage in God's word. Stand on God's word and say, do what you like. I must stand on the word of God. But a minister, a watchman, must also have zeal. Zeal for God's house must consume him. A watchman who has no zeal, how can he be fired up with the things of the kingdom? How can he encourage others to be fired up in the things of the kingdom? He must be about doing his master's duty and ensuring that his flame 
within is kept on burning and burning. He mustn't be like David. Sadly, at some point, David loses his zeal. And when he should be in the field with the army leading his people on, he's at home resting. When the kings go out to war, he's at home. And what then happens? He falls. Terrible fall. Zeal had gone out of him. The fire had been put out. Put out. So the watchman must be careful. Zealous. He must be zealous for himself. Zealous for the Lord's work. Zealous for his own spirituality. Zealous for the spirituality of others. So that when people cry out, Watchman, watchman, what of the night? He can stand and say, The night will soon be over with zeal. Watchman, watchman, when, when will Christ come? Soon. Soon. Keep on at it. Keep on moving. Hold on. Hang on. It's not over yet. But it will be over one day. One moment. But dear friends. Another characteristic. Of a watchman. A church minister. Is integrity. Integrity is so vital. And we all fail. Many of us, ministers included, in integrity. But it's so vital to have integrity. A church minister must behave themselves in such a way as church members will see no fault. And even if they do, they say to themselves, that's a minor fault. Integrity, so important. The minister must watch himself and make sure that there is nothing scandalous that is going on in his life. But integrity means how does he deal with church members or church congregants, especially members of the opposite gender? How does he relate to them? Must be with great purity. And great carefulness. And must never be in a compromising situation. Calling for members of the opposite gender to meet him during the week. That's not integrity. It doesn't matter what reason he might have. Being found alone with members of the opposite gender. Anywhere. That doesn't Look well for integrity. Visiting a married woman when her husband is away. That doesn't look well for the minister's integrity. The minister must be above board. He must behave himself in a way that is above the ordinary member of the church. What might be acceptable for an ordinary member of the church, the minister must stay away from. The minister must not be texting members of the opposite gender in his fellowship without due reason. Unnecessary text and must never use emotive language. Oh dear sister, I enjoy your company. Oh, dear sister, it was good to see you the other day. What are you doing? Integrity is so essential. A man I don't agree with in many ways, but I respect it. 
in terms of things that he held on to was Billy Graham. Billy Graham, he had a statement about church ministers. What brings down church ministers? And he said the three F's bring down church ministers. Funding, females, and fame. Those three F's, they bring down church ministers. So he made a decision right from the beginning. A bit extreme, you might think, but that was Billy Graham. Number one. Never to be with an, a female, a woman, just the two of them, in the absence of his wife. So his wife was always there, almost always, whenever he had a woman to talk to. She wasn't very close. She wouldn't always be very close if he's counseling, but she'll be somewhere where she would be seen. And then fame, he made it clear he wasn't interested in fame. And so he took measures to make sure that he didn't get interviewed by journalists so much and push his name out there. And funding, he made sure that someone else was handling the finances. And those are good principles for integrity a minister, a watchman, must have integrity. But another characteristic of a watchman, a minister, is to be sober. It's the opposite of being drunk. A person that's drunk has no control over themselves, over what they say, what they do. They're silly. A church minister must not be silly. There must be some soberness about them. But also another characteristic of a church minister, a watchman, is faithfulness. Always being there when you are needed. When you can be there, you are. One uh, dear sister in our fellowship, I won't mention her name, I don't want to embarrass her. She did state that there's a statement made about being available for services in the Lord's house, morning service, evening service, during the week. You can if you can't. I hope I'm saying it correctly. She'll let me know afterwards. Come if you can. And come, come if you can't. Come if you can, and come if you cannot. Wonderful, isn't it? I hope I said that right. The point is, there should be no excuses apart from genuine excuses from staying away from God's house. A genuine excuse such as, oh, I don't feel like, that's, that's not a, a genuine excuse, pardon me. An excuse like that is ingenuine. Oh, it's too much. It's not genuine. Oh, I feel slightly out of sorts. That's not genuine. And so there must be faithfulness. The church minister cannot afford to say, I'm not going to say such and such person to minister to them I feel tired you have to get up like that mother who has to get up to feed her baby regardless of our position our situation her child is crying out for milk or she wants to feed the child it's feeding time she feels tired but she still has to get up her mother looking after her children in her house who are requiring a meal Regardless of our feelings, she'll go up and cook. And so the church minister should have that faithfulness, being available and doing all that he can to be faithful. Faithful 
as well to the Lord's word, not varying from the Lord's word, faithful to the people of God, not slandering anyone in the church, not bringing them down, not despising anyone in the church, not hating anyone, not wanting the worst for anyone, but always wanting the best for the people in the church. Faithfulness includes as well that the minister is able to say, Lord, I have done all that I could have done, so help me. Faithfulness, the church minister, we're running out of time. Just a few lessons for us. Just as much as church ministers have obligations, duties, and characteristics, every Christian has obligations and characteristics. Every Christian should be on the lookout. Look out for God's people. Have a holy instinct for those who might be going through difficult times and approach them and say, Dear sister, how are you? Dear brother, how are you doing? It's best for those that know the others to go up and ask, how are you doing? If you don't know that person well, it might not be advisable. But the question is, why don't you know them well? Do you not talk to them? Is there anyone in the assembly of God's people that you don't talk to? That's a problem. Oh, but I'm shy. Pray to the Lord to give you courage. Oh, but I'm not like that. Oh, pray to the Lord to give you courage. How do you know the other person is saying the same things? And so you have two people in the church saying, I'm not like that. And they can't talk to each other because they're both saying, I'm not like that. Take some courage. Hello doesn't cost you anything. Hello. We haven't talked. Start there. Hello, we don't speak to one another. Oh, but that person is deaf. I don't know how to sign. Well, learn some signs. I can teach you one or two signs. Hello, it's just a wave. That's it, hello. How nice is that? And thank you. There you go. That's your first lesson. Don't ask me any more after that. But the point is, we shouldn't be ignoring anyone in the fellowship. Look out. But also we look out for those who are bringing trouble into the fellowship, possible trouble. Be on guard. Be vigilant. There's a brother I knew many years ago. He had a Facebook group. And in this church, he used to try and invite people to come to his house so that he can come and show them the truth. People were saying, but we hear the word of God from the church. What truth are you going to tell us? Oh, no, no, no. I've got better truth. Anyone who tells you they've got something new or better truth, run away from that. There is one truth and it's found in the scriptures. And God has appointed church ministers to declare that word. God has authorized the ministers to de declare his word. And we listen to the word of God. Only when ministers are faithful to God's word do we listen. If they're not, we don't listen. But we look out for people who just want to cause trouble. And they're misleading others, taking others, taking little groups of people away from the central part of God's people in a local congregation. And so God's people are to be looking out looking out for the truth, looking out for those who will tell things that are not right, 
looking up one for another. And then God's people are to speak up. If your pastor's going astray, speak up. Don't be afraid. If another person in the church is going astray, speak up. Don't be afraid. Approach them, the scriptures say. Approach them and say, brother, sister, this is what the scriptures say. What are you saying? What do you say about this? And then if the brother is not repentant or sister, bring another person as a witness. This is what the Bible says. If they're not repentant, tell it to the church. And if they still continue, you ask them, bye-bye. And that will be a blessed departure from God's people. And so we are to look out and speak up as God's people. We are to have knowledge as Christians. Every Christian should be looking out for knowledge. Don't just depend on the preacher. But also, it helps to read up. Read the scriptures, know them well. Read good books so that you can challenge the preacher if he's going astray. A time is almost up. They must be sober. Every Christian must be sober. Must have integrity. Must have courage and zeal. Every Christian must be reliable. Just as every church minister must be reliable, every Christian must be reliable. Yes, we fall. And oftentimes are not reliable, but we must endeavor to be reliable. People must be able to rely on us. How often we complain when the bus or the train is late. We want a reliable service. But we want a reliable service. Are we reliable ourselves? Are we always there when we need it? Our time's up. May the Lord help us with these few words. Let's uh, sing our final hymn, 523, 523. Keep us, Lord, or keep us ever. Vain our hope, if left by thee.
now and to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.